tonight on Love and Respect, a conversation with civil rights icon Andrew Young. Just because you're good and decent and want to be righteous doesn't mean that you don't really have a pot boiling inside you. Yes. And you, you want to, you, you might want to do something rash and violent. There's a streak of violence in just about everybody. Yeah. The important thing is to realize that that's not where your strength is. Yes, sir. Your strength is in your mind, in the love and forgiveness and respect that's in your heart. Absolutely. See, I mean, that's where the power is. You can overcome more people with love and respect. Yes, sir. Than you can cussing and shouting and calling them all kinds of names. Ambassador Andrew Young coming up right now. I want to welcome my friend, my mentor, my hero, Ambassador Andrew Young, the love and respect. Thank you so much. For Very good. Good to be with you. Absolutely. You have our civil rights icon, former director of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. You are a United Nations ambassador. And I personally have Atlanta mayor, my favorite mayor thus far. And I know you, um, was first acknowledging your wife, Carolyn, but your late wife, Jean Charles Young, was also a friend and mentor of mine, and I belong to an organization. Well, that's she where I met you. That's where we she met. She brought you to my office. I was 15 years old. You want to tell the story? <laughs> yeah, no. Jean, uh, my first wife of 40 years, mm -hmm. who unfortunately died of cancer, yeah. um, was the advisor to the mayor's youth council yeah. with Alice Johnson. Yep. And um, she said, we want to come see you with a few of the young people. And I said, fine. And um, I said, what do they want? She said, they'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and you came in and you asked me for, said you wanted to have a conference. Yes. And I said, well, that's easy. I said, no, but we don't want to have a conference where people are telling us what to do. We want to have a conference with young people and let us decide for ourselves what we want to do. Yeah. We arranged for you to have that yeah. for Saturday morning. Yes, sir. Until uh, about 3 o'clock, I think. Yes, sir. You had one kid that had just gotten out of jail. Yeah. And I forget his name, but I'll never forget him. And he wanted to lead the discussion on world hunger. Yeah. And uh, I couldn't see the connection. But when I got in there immediately, he said he'd just gotten out of prison and he said what he was in for, and, and I, I don't remember, but uh, he said, I was there and I said, Ethiopian famine yeah. came on television. And I saw all of these people with their stomachs full and flies around their face and out in the night, no place to stay, uh, hot, too hot in the day and too cold at night. And he said, and I realized that I had messed up. Mm -hmm. And I was, had a bed mm -hmm. and three meals a day, even in jail. Mm -hmm. I was living better than they were and I had done wrong and they had done no wrong. Yeah. And he said, I decided if I, when I get out, I wanted to do something about world hunger. Yeah. Well, I was so impressed. Before you all finished that day, you had decided that you were going to raise money for the Ethiopian famine. Yes, sir. Uh, and the way you decided to do it was by putting canisters in the banks. Yep. So as people say, why do folk rob banks? Because that's where the money <laughs> is. But if you want to raise money, that's where the right. money is. <laughs> and um, so nobody touched any money. No. But everybody could contribute. Uh, and the banks created an account. And I think, I don't know how you got the banks to, to, to comply, but I think you had pretty good participation with all the banks. Yeah. Raised over $100,000. Yeah, we did pretty good. And had a parade yeah. down Peachtree uh, to end world hunger. Yeah. And then um, you had a committee. Yeah. Um, deciding who was it that had the best record of getting money 
and food to hungry people. Directly to them and not just paying staff. Yeah. Absolutely. So you uh, decided it was UNICEF. Yeah. Uh, well, I had just left the world, the, the UN, so I knew them. They were tickled to death to have this happen. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether you took the money to them or sent it to them. I think we sent. Mm -hmm. I think we sent it. Yeah. It and But the money went straight to Ethiopia. Yeah. That was the first, of course, you were almost as big as you are now. <laughs> uh, and you were just 15. Mm -hmm. And I said, this kid's going to amount to something. I appreciate it. And um, they had made a good investment in you, but you made a good investment in the other young people. You had over 500 students there. I appreciate you at that time. And you have, before then, because those, the 90s were turbulent time. We were in the middle of the crack era and a drug war, gangs had kind of influenced Atlanta in a way. Well, that, that was still under, the 80s. Yeah, yeah, it was 89, 90, yep, right. Yeah. It got a little worse in the 90s, but it was the late 80s. But you guys, you grew up in very turbulent times, yet since my grandmother first took me out the campaign for you as a child, you've always exuded this spirit of peace about you. Um, and you named your memoir an easy burden. You always had a calm like you. Were you always this calm and easy going because amongst the characters around Dr. King, you were known as the, the guy that kind of kept his wits about Well, I was probably the smallest one. Okay. <laughs> and I was one of the younger ones. Gotcha. But I had always been, I grew up in New Orleans and I had, a, I grew up in the middle of a block. Mm -hmm. On one corner was an Irish grocery store. Another corner was an Italian bar. The third corner was the Nazi party headquarters. Uh, this was 1932 when I was born. And I can remember 1936, my daddy walking by there because it was right in the middle of, uh, uh, I mean, it was right on the corner. And my aunt lived two doors behind the Nazi party. And see, Hitler was just coming on the scene then. Yeah. And my father took me to the segregated movie to see Jesse Owens. Is this where you sit up top and the white yeah. patrons are at the bottom? Black folks sat on the balcony. Yes, sir. White folks sat at the top, uh, at the bottom. Uh, but we all saw the same movie, and I wasn't particular about, I mean, I, I, it didn't bother me. Yeah. That was, what, I accepted that then. And, uh, but when Jesse Owens won the 100-meter dash, Hitler was supposed to give him his Olympic medal. Yeah. And instead of doing that, he got up angry and walked out. My grandfather tells me this story. See, what and, happened? And, and took all of his stormtroopers with him. See? And that was an insult to Jesse Owens, but that wasn't Jesse's problem. He said Jesse's problem, he had three more races to run. And if he'd gotten upset over what Hitler did on that first race, he might not have been as sharp and say so Hitler I mean Hitler stormed out angry but Jesse stayed cool yeah and he just won three more gold medals <laughs> you talked about keeping your cool and you are an ordained minister um, devout Christian and oftentimes so when you're speaking to people as I've heard you grow up much like the Messiah much like Jesus you don't use religion to try to convince people you are are a persuader, it seems like, in ways. You kind of meet people where they are and talk to them versus kind of standing on the mountaintop well, you know, pointing down. One of the things that the Bible says is all men sin and fall short of the glory of God. Yes, sir. And women do too. <laughs> I have twice. I add that. <laughs> a day you choose. <laughs> uh, but I never see myself as better than anybody else. I know the struggles I have to be reasonable and halfway calm and intelligent. It's, it's something I've been practicing, as I said, since I was four years old. Yeah. I want to table that because I want to talk a little bit about the characters of people around you. But before we get to that, two people who they always juxtapose to one another. You knew both of them. And one was Martin King, of course, Martin Luther King Jr. And the other one was, was Malcolm X. You knew Malcolm. You told yeah. me from you were I met Man Malcolm Man. before. Martin, right? I met Martin. Okay. I, I went to a little country church in Marion, Alabama, mm -hmm. then Thomasville in Beechton, Georgia, and then they offered me a job in New York. Uh -huh. 
and um, my secretary in that National Council of Churches, they didn't have any black executives and they wanted a black executive and they made me uh, associate director of the Department of Youth Work. Yes, sir. And I had a television show on CBS, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, Look Up and Live. Uh, we won Emmys and we won a Peabody Award. Oh wow! See, and I was, I was, I was, I was just about 25. In your being there, in your ministering there, and then you're having television shows. You come across this guy well, from the Nation of Islam, Malcolm X. Well, what was your first? My, thought on my secretary was married to Louis Lomax. Louis Lomax was interviewing Malcolm. That was the show that made Malcolm famous, but it did Malcolm a disservice. How so? Well, it, they titled it The Hate That Hate Produced. And I never saw Malcolm hate anybody. Malcolm was one of the sweetest, calmest, easygoing men I know, I've ever met. He, he had no temper. Yeah. No, he spoke with authority like Martin Luther King did. Yes. <laughs> and you would think it was a prophet from the top of Mount Olympus somewhere. Uh, but around a dinner table, uh, Lewis and B, B, his wife, invited me and Jean over to dinner. He kept asking me questions about the South. And see, he had been in jail. Yes. And he had no, didn't have an opportunity to go to one of the HBCUs. Yeah. But I admired him because he taught himself by reading the dictionary. Yes. See? And he was constantly inquisitive. He was at, I mean, I didn't get to talk to him much because he was trying to pick my brain about everything. Yeah. See? And we were working with young people, and I'd been to Africa, I'd been to Europe, and I'd been down south was what he was mostly interested in. But he kept asking me questions. And, um, and I just thought he was one of the gentlest souls I've ever met. Yeah. Later on, when Martin King won the Nobel Prize, Malcolm came to the back door at the armory to meet him. And there were two people back there to meet him, Rockefeller, Governor Rockefeller, and Malcolm X. Well, Martin went off with Malcolm X. Wow. And Malcolm said to him, I just wanted to come and congratulate you, and I want you to know I'm totally in support of everything you do. He said, but I just think that it's best for me not to be seen with you. He said, because if they don't deal with you, they might think twice because they don't know what I mean. What, they don't know me. Yes, sir. And they might rather deal with you than deal with me. And so he wouldn't even come into the meeting. Wow. Uh, but Rock, Governor Rockefeller came in. It's amazing that, you, that they understood that they're fighting for the same purpose, maybe on different paths provided leverage for one another because well it, it it really wasn't on different paths yeah. because I think they were very much alike in terms of their spirits yes sir the only time Martin got loud was on a platform <laughs> <laughs> the only time Malcolm got loud was on the platform yeah. so speaking around the dinner table he he talked just above a whisper wow now Elijah Muhammad had that same kind of uh, calm about him. Yes, sir. In fact, anybody that's spiritual, um, you know, has to kind of calm themselves down because yes, just because you're good and decent and want to be righteous doesn't mean that you don't really have a pot boiling inside you. Yes. And you, you want to, you, you might want to do something rash and violent. There's a streak of violence in just about everybody. Yeah. The important thing is to realize that that's not where your strength is. Yes, sir. Your strength is in your mind, in the love and forgiveness and respect that's in your heart. Absolutely. See? I mean, that's where the power is. You can overcome more people with love and respect. Yes, sir. Than you can cussing and shouting and calling them all kinds of names. 
there are a few names that I know you are right next to because now we argue over which leaders. Like we argue over Malcolm and Martin when I was a kid. People argue. So it's very refreshing to hear you say how similar in spirit because you knew both of them. Yeah. Where a lot of times we're just arguing ideology. But these are people you actually knew. And I just like to say well, the name. People caricatured mm -hmm. them. And they wanted to make Martin one thing and Malcolm another. Yeah. They probably were much closer as brothers. And Martin could get, he wouldn't get mad, but I think some of his speeches are far more militant than anything Malcolm said. Yeah. The speech that he gave at Riverside Church against the war in Vietnam. Yes. Uh, where he faced up to the fact that he was ashamed, but that America was the most violent force on the face of the earth. I'm going to name a few other names. Just give me a few, few words on them. Um, people that I've, some have known and some have grown around. Ralph David Abernathy. Ralph Abernathy was the one who was responsible for Martin Luther King. <laughs> so that was his home. That was his, his side. That was his... Well, yeah, because Martin... See, Martin was 25 yeah. when he went to Montgomery. Yeah, because he was only 16 when he got in Morehouse, right? Yeah. A young man. And uh, he went to Montgomery because he wanted to be calm. He wanted to be quiet. And he felt that Dexter Avenue was the most conservative Baptist church in the town, <laughs> okay. in, in, the, in the South. And he figured, I won't get in any trouble here. Okay. He said, if I get, stay in Atlanta, they'll try to push me into politics or something. And I don't want that. I want to be a good preacher. Gotcha. And he finished his PhD dissertation, mailed it to Boston University. And two weeks later, Rosa Parks sat down in the bus. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he wasn't even thinking about leading the movement. Yeah. He was in the back of the church running a mimeograph machine, making handbills. They voted him in without even asking him. And fortunately for us, uh, Coretta was expecting and she couldn't be there. And she got the choir director from um, Dext Avenue uh, to tape record his speech. Now, it was about seven o'clock at night, maybe later, that they elected him for an 8 o'clock meeting. And he's 25 years old. This was in December. He didn't turn 26 till the 15th of January. Yeah. And um, he didn't have any time to make any notes or, you know, write a speech. And, you know, what preachers do, the only thing you can do when you get caught like that is go to the bathroom and lock the door. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's where you can be calm and get your thoughts together. But if you ever read that speech that he made at Montgomery, it had all of the seeds of everything else he did. Butter. Um, and, and it was one of his best speeches that he had to give with no preparation time and no notes, say no manuscript, but it was a testimony to what he had learned at Morehouse and at Boston University. And, and, and it, it was what God had put in his heart. And that's the reason I say that leadership is God-given and God-ordained. Yes, sir. And they couldn't have put anybody else in that spot who would have done what he did. Yeah. So uh, looking at him, because he's from 25 now. to 39, he didn't make 40. Yeah. 14 years of a May yeah. changing the course of American history. And uh, reluctant of the world. Leadership. Yeah, and reluctant leadership. Yeah. I've, I'm a believer in reluctant leadership. Like I, well, I am too. Yeah, because yeah, anybody that's willing to put the head on a chopping block is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he he said that to us one time, and it's one of the things that keeps me going. Yes, sir. He said, you know, we have to be clinically insane to think that this crazy bunch of young Negroes yeah. can save this nation. He said, we probably won't make it till we're 40. He said, but if we make it to 40, past 40, we're going to have to struggle to 100 because 
it's not ever going to be easy. Yes, sir. And um, I think that's one of the things that kind of makes me try to keep going yeah. because um, he didn't make it to 40. Yeah. And I did. And knocking on the door 90. Yeah. And um, look at 70. I you can't, look great. I can't. Um, I can't think that all of the things I've been through are in vain. Yes, sir. Everything that has happened to me was for some purpose. Yeah. See? And like, I think that the fact that I had an Irish grocery store, an Italian bar, a Nazi party, and a Chevrolet dealership where I was born, I was destined to be an ambassador, though I didn't know what an ambassador was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to negotiate my way to keep getting my ass kicked to get to the grocery store. <laughs> see? And I learned to be nice. I learned that if you showed fear, you were in trouble. Yeah. But if you were aggressively polite and nice to everybody, you got respect. Next time on Love and Respect with Killer Mike, more with civil rights icon Andrew Young. I'd been to South Africa a couple of times already, but I'd never met with the white South Africans. See, and the State Department didn't want me. They said, no, we need you to talk to the African leaders. I said, no, I talk to them all the time. They come to Atlanta. <laughs> See? Uh, we're friends. I said, I, I need to. Uh, they said, well, why? I said, who's the meanest son of a bitch you got to deal with? <laughs> <laughs>